Welcome to Unsuccessful Demo. In each episode, we will analyze the theoretical and practical worst things you can do with newly released cards. Today, we are going to look at the HB card, MCA Austerity Policy. Now, th throughout this episode, I'm going to say a lot about synergies and anti-synergies. These are very core aspects to deck building that you should take note of. First and foremost, MCA, which I, I will call MCA for short from now on, um, is actually a card that synergizes very well in faction with HBIs such as uh, Fairchild 3 and Turing. This is because most uh, some runners are usually okay with spending their entire turn uh, breaking Fairchild 3 and or Turing with clicks. However, MC Austerity Policy has its first ability which allows you to drain one very precious click from the runner, leaving them with only 3 clicks to start their turn with and unable to break Fairchild 3 or Turing with clicks. So this sounds like a very good synergy, but it's not really. Because what if, what if the runner chooses not to run? <gasps> if that happens, they will never encounter the ice. They will never have to face check, uh, get uh, face check punished by Fairchild 3. Therefore, this combo is useless. And there are such runners. Diaper is a menace. Therefore, to... Um, guarantee effectiveness across the board, we will not play MCA Austerity Policy with the HB Ice. What other synergies are there? Well, some of you might be thinking of playing um, MCA with an uh, asset spam based deck, something like an encryption protocol to protect the MCA. But once again, this is anti-synergistic. Let's look at the second ability of MCA. It states that you need to trash the MCA in order to reap its benefits. But if you're trashing it, the runner is not! And if they are not trashing it, then encryption protocol is useless. By trashing your own MCA, the runner doesn't have to trash it for you, doesn't have to pay the extra encryption tax. Therefore, this is a bad synergy. We shouldn't play, play encryption protocol. What about friends? It's touted as a very powerful card, and it sure is. Except that it is not. This is an anti-synergistic card with MCA because after playing friends to recur MCA, you think you're all good, you can start getting your clicks. No. After you play friends, it's a terminal, it ends your turn. You cannot load up MCA on the very same turn. Even interns is better at doing this than friends. Due to this, we are not going to play friends either. With so many HB cards, good HB cards at that, they are just not compatible with MCA. What can we do? Well, we notice that MCA is 3 influence. And that's not a lot. I mean, other decks splash for cards like Freeze or boom, spending lots of influence on it. I'm sure we can spare a bunch of influence for, of MCA by playing it out of faction. I propose playing it in NBN. Due to the massive amount of fast advanced tools we have in faction, we have the Sansang Grid, we have the Astro Script Power Counter, and we have Psychographics. All these cards give you some form or shape of, mechan uh, of some mechanism to fast advance. Combine that with MCA Austerity, and you have four different ways you can ad fast advance in a single deck. Sansan allows you to advance with fewer counters. Astroscript gives you more advancement counters. MCA gives you extra clicks to fast advance, and Psychographics just dumps a bunch of advancements on your agenda. So all these in combination will give us the most powerful fast advance deck known to mankind. Of course, we have to be aware that fast advance has, it count has its counters. But because we have so much fast advance, we don't even care about the counters. Who cares about Clot? Let's not even bother playing with cyber decks. This is where it's at. Play all the fast advance cards and win. What else? Let's look at psychographics because we need some enablers for psychographics. There are some very good options out there. We know that CTM is a very powerful way to enable psychographics um, because it won worlds last year. So that's pretty good. However, I think um, once again, you're falling into the trap of encryption protocol um, because it anti-synergizes with MCA. The runner isn't trashing. Uh, if you trash the MCA yourself, you're not triggering CTM. So CTM is a bad card. Breaking news is okay, but it costs influence and we don't like spending influence since we spend so much on MCA. What about mid-seasons? It requires the runner to steal an agenda. What bullcrap is that? No, we can't have that. And finally, hard-hitting news. This is probably the most powerful card to enable psychographics, except, is it really? It, re it requires a run. Diaper is just gonna wreck you. So all of these are just trash. Let's play psychographics somewhere else. Our enabler for psychographics is gonna be none other 
then sync. That is right. Don't laugh. Sync doesn't give tags. I know, I know. But the most important thing is this. With sync, you can ruse the runner into thinking that you are playing that stupid World's 2016 deck that came in second place. That is the secret sauce of this deck. You are going to ruse the runner into believing that you don't have psychographics in your deck. When you actually do! The original deck list doesn't have it, but this one does. Gotcha. Uh, of course, you can only pull this trick off if um, people know you for creating this sync deck, which uh, most people can't lay claim to. But, well, if you want to, um, so this is why you can't really copy my deck list, because you can't replicate uh, the fact that people will get ruse by you. So what you need to do before de uh, net decking this deck is to first come in second place at Worlds. That way, you can then ruse your opponents with a deck like Sync with Psychographics. Trust me, this is going to be a really good deck, and I'm going to show it to you in action what could possibly go wrong. So today we are up against Max, and the first thing that pops up to my mind is, well, if this isn't the world's second place deck, isn't it? This could very well be a Siphon Max, and we don't want to be Siphon turn 1, even though we are Sync. So let's pile up the ice on HQ, and, you know, save ourselves the trouble of getting Siphon later on. So yeah, um, right off the bat, this is going to be an interesting matchup. Sure, they don't have DDoS, but yeah, the Joshua B comes out, and I'm like, I'm so glad I protected HQ. Now I'm going to just keep uh, drawing here. No, I'm just going to take credits because you need all the money in the world against uh, Max Siphon deck. Looks like they're going to be resource based given the Joshua B. So I need to be able to contest the resource rig once it gets set up. Sync is incredibly adept at doing so, and for that reason, it's a very good matchup for Sync, as long as you don't deck yourself out. So the wireless net pavilion comes out, which hints to me that I really should start flipping my ID sooner rather than later. This is something that I'm keeping at the back of my mind every single turn. For now, I'm looking at my HQ eyes and asking myself, can I defend from a same old account siphon, which is available to my opponent uh, right now? And the answer is a very clear no. Um, because of this, I chose to play the HQ toll booth instead of taking the credit IPO, which I very easily could, burst myself up to 13 credits and immediately get siphoned. That doesn't sound good at all. You don't want to give your opponent free money and more importantly, free tags. So uh, even though it delayed my IPO by one turn, it was more well, uh, yeah, well worth it because now... Um, I'm at the 13 credit mark, I can rest a Tobu for 8, I can rest the 2 barriers inside for 5, and that will drain all my siphon money, leaving my opponent unable to siphon me. Additionally, it's incredibly taxing. Given that my opponent is running the Conspiracy Breaker Suite, it's going to be 9 credits a pop through that Tobu. No kidding. This is why Tobuf is one of still one of the best pieces of ice in the game. Even though Fairchild 3 and DNA Tracker have appeared, still... Um, none of, neither of them hard end the run as well as Tobuf does. So that's something important to keep in mind. So due to the amount of uh, burst econ that I've drawn, I'm now up to a healthy 22 credits. Uh, very easily can contest my opponent's board, but given that they're installing Obelus, I think I might be in a bit of a pickle here. So they haven't gone tank me yet, they, have, they can't really do so. Uh, my opponent's very smart here. They could be triggering the Joshua B, but if they do, I'm just going to trash all the same old things and their counter surveillance as well with sync. This is not something my opponent wants to fall to. So here I draw into a toll booth, and this seems like a good time to start pumping out those BUs in my hand. They are starting to clog up hand space. The trouble is, I do not want to make a new remote now when my opponent might be running something like a spoon or something that destroys my outer toll booth on HQ. Tobu from HQ is easily one of the best solutions against Max, who now goes in for a Siphon, and I greet them with a nasty Tobu. If they want to come in, they are down to 10 credits, they need to pay uh, 9 to get the Black Orchestra out from the bin and break it. So obviously they can't afford to do that, they're going to jack out, that's a waste of a same old thing. I'm more than happy to entertain my opponent there, and then they get the God of War out. Alright, so we have confirmed that this is a God of War deck. My opponent cannot win without going tag me, right? So this deck completely relies on getting lots of tags because that way you can get deep digs with counter surveillance. This is one of the biggest Achilles heels of a counter surveillance based deck. 
um, if you don't have a non-tag me option because that way if you are going no tags you can't access enough agendas to win there's just no way so my opponents hold into taking tags against sync and that is almost always a bad idea isn't it they first have to buff up the hand size to protect against the boom that doesn't exist in my deck and then they have to get enough money to siphon their way through hq to get more tags good luck with that so they start with a mass of, uh, for martians for a pathetic two credits and happily leave themselves with Fewer card, fewer than seven cards in hand. I mean, I don't know. This is just outright disrespect. Do you even know who I am? Well, they don't. So I'm just gonna trash all their resources. See you. <laughs> Jokes on you. No counter surveillance for you, and no wireless net pavilion because well, I can trash it <laughs> for two credits and it's gone forever. So jokes on you. Uh, my opponent retorts very nicely though, uh, giving them an extra click with Josh B. Josh B is a very high value target that I definitely wanted to kill there, but I lost one click to flipping my identity. So yeah, I definitely should have tried to flip my ID earlier instead of taking more credits. Um, having an extra click to deactivate Joshua B would have been really nice. But now my opponent gets the wireless now with the Jarong Um, How do you pronounce that damn thing? Jarong New Mix! So with that card installed, my opponent's basically immune to meat damage until I basically contest their entire resource rig. Well, I'm gonna rest the toll booth here since I'm gonna try to run and steal my build. Very nice rhyme there. Um, unfortunately, they're gonna be able to get it um, and it does drain me of quite a bit of my money. So not very comfortable with that, but hey, at least they had to pay a bunch of credits to get through that, meaning that I have a pretty nice you know, I, I have a breeder for a turn or two. So a very nice time to, you know, uh, recuperate. And you know, this is buying me clicks to trash my opponent's resource rig because, um, yeah, trashing their rig costs clicks, which is more valuable than credits at this point. Uh, the click intensiveness of it means that my opponent can easily gain tempo on me. And to counter that, obviously, uh, my opponent basically dumped a lot of their money into the remote toll wolf just to get the bill. Worth it for them, but now they have to spend the next few turns drawing up cards, getting credits and stuff. And yeah, now with Joshua B gone, my opponent only has 4 clicks, they are going to get a Liberator on the table, which I'm immediately going to rip from their cold, cold-blooded hands. I'm also going to ruse them here by trashing the Yerognev mercs. Hopefully they'll make them play inefficiently just to, you know, um, play around that boom for the rest of the game. That should be interesting to see. I mean, to me, it doesn't really cost that much. It only cost me an extra click to ruse them uh, because trashing the Yerognith mercs is free with Sync's ability. So now my opponent goes for more Mars for Martians. That card is really hard to deal with um, if you don't have close accounts in your deck. Uh, and even if you do, you know, uh, they still get the credits for the rest of the turn. So during that time, my opponent could easily counter surveillance or in this case, levy to get all the cards back. So here we go again. Well, what do we do here? This is going to be an interesting juncture. Now that they have God of War out, they can theoretically get into any server. But of course, um, it's super expensive to break all the four strength barriers that I have uh, on HQ, Eli and IP block. Both cost 8 credits per pop with God of War. My opponent will definitely not afford that. They have to wait for the paperclip to show up once more. I've finally drawn my psychographics here and here I'm scratching my head so hard. Do I wait? This is so difficult. Do I wait for my opponent to incubate those 13 tags for me to win? Well, theoretically I could I could fire it off as early as 11 or 12 uh, with Sansan San and you know all that stuff. Uh, extra clicks and all. But yeah... Um, it's going to take at least about four turns if I'm going to let my opponent incubate the God of War uh, to give themselves more tags. And if they do, that's four extra turns I have to defend this build from in my hand. This is something I'm rather uncomfortable with because my opponent knows that I haven't been scoring agendas all this while. I haven't been pitching anything to the bin with Jackson to recur. So they should know that there are a lot of agendas in my hand. In fact, if they fire off the counter surveillance on HQ, which they very well can, it is something you can do, they will immediately win. There are too many agendas in hand. So this is why I chose to remove the build entirely from the game. Um, <laughs> play them in the wrong order there, stupid me. But yeah, get it out of circulation. Um, so hopefully my opponent will be less drawn to HQ. 
I mean, the prospect of firing counter surveillance on HQ is very unlikely given that it's so taxing and the fact that they need to have enough credits equal to the tags to perform the multi-access. So it, or it is, is already very unlikely, but here I just chose to get the four point build out of the way, meaning that I need to score three more points to win. And my thought is that with the sand sand and tow booth remote, um, I should be able to get the Astro and then the 15 minutes out to win. That's my scoring plan. But here comes things. Yeah, he's throwing me a wrench here. Uh, he's gonna siphon me and, and I don't have double toe booth to protect, protect me. All I can do is to duck the siphon, which is pretty good, don't get me wrong. But unfortunately, this means that this reduces my credit pool very low. And again, this is kind of why another reason why I chose to pump out that build as early as I did, because I knew that if I were to get Siphon at any point, which was very likely if I gave my opponent 4 extra turns to recover, that I would, I might go out of range for the big Psycho build. Don't forget, it's very expensive to maintain my HQ Ice and to have enough credits for the big Psycho. So I'm, I just wanted to get the agenda out while I could. Uh, this basically breaks my back in terms of economy. I'm now down to 3 credits and my opponent has the same old thing on the board. So against a Siphon Spam deck, uh, needless to say, but some people still don't know this, your first priority pretty much is trashing that same old thing because a lot of bad things can happen if you leave same old things on the table. So yeah, um, I accidentally clicked my ID there because I keep thinking that, thinking that clicking my ID allows me to trash my opponent's stuff, but it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, the same old thing goes, and this is why Sync is so awesome, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, against the tag me matchup, if they're relying on resources, it's going to be really difficult for them to stick it on the table. And as the runner, you should not leave your resources exposed like that, especially against Sync. Same old thing, such a key card, I would definitely have kept it in my hand, given that um, I'm running Orbellus, it makes a lot of sense to keep it in my hand as opposed to playing it, when my opponent can simply trash it for a single click. Uh, yeah. So, where are we now? Um, I have a Jackson and Sand Sand remote, which is really useless right now. I don't have nearly enough credits to fast advance an Astro script, and it's a bit too dangerous for me to just drop the Astro script in the tow booth remote. Um, it's a very important agenda for getting to 7 points, <clears throat> because otherwise my only out is to find the last cycle, which can be really difficult. Um, so here I'm going to use a Jackson and try to dig for another cycle that might be in my deck. And I'm going to play the Sweet Sweet here, which will give me a boatload of cash. Thanks for the Orbalus money. Really appreciate it. You have your Mars for Martians, I have my Sweet Sweet into Orbalus. I love it. Notice that I ditched the Sand Sand instead of the Global Food here. Increasingly, I'm starting to realize that again, Siphon Spam, the, ma the safest place for your agendas is in hand. Given that my opponent's only real out is counter surveillance to R&D, if I keep all my agendas in hand, they won't be able to win off R&D. So that's the hope. We'll see if that happens. In the meantime, I'm just leaving Jackson there. Hopefully, I mean, sooner, sooner or later, I'm going to just shuffle my psychographics that's in the bin back into my deck. Hopefully I draw it and I can fast advance, cycle out the food for the win. That's another way to go. Um, so uh, another possible way to go was to fast advance the Astro here. Uh, with 13 credits, I can fast advance the Astro and then score 15 minutes to win. Unfortunately, my opponent siphons me here, making me very poor. So uh, uh, that plan is put on hold for a while. Uh, they do go through for the Siphon, I do rest the Eli here, but it's still breakable. The most important thing though, is that it's costing them more money to break it than it is for me, uh, yeah, than, than what they're getting, than, yeah, than the net profit. Uh, the toll booth costs 9, the IP block is, what, 8 credits from God of War? <laughs> and Eli's another 2 clicks, so yeah, um, very very expensive Siphon right there. Um, what did I do on my turn? I played a bunch of money. So the hedge fund and IPO allowed me to get back in uh, Astro Script scoring range. I'm very happy about that. Although I would much rather have seen the psychographics at this point. So, how's my opponent going to win this game? Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I'm starting to count my agendas right now. So the agenda suite here is three global foods. Three project bills, one Astro, and one 15 minutes. So you, after counting, you'll find that the only agendas left in R&D are the final bill and one global food. So that's four agenda points for the runner, which means they can only get up to six agenda points. They cannot uh, conceivably win off R&D. And yeah, 
Um, that means that I don't really care about this counter surveillance at all. <laughs> very, very funny enough. Um, and my opponent made a rather small mistake there. They should have ran archives before doing the big counter surveillance because, um, yeah, without checking archives, they cannot be sure that there are enough agendas in R&D for them to win. I could very well be stashing all my agendas in archives and uh, they won't be able to fetch it with the counter surveillance, which could possibly buy me more time to win with a cycle. These small details are what gives you extra win percentage points in such a very tight matchup where you're always on your toes, where a single cycle graphics can lose you the game. So yeah, um, small misstep by my opponent there, but they still do manage to fetch all the agendas that I wanted them to fetch. Now, this 8 agenda suite, 4 of them are in the score area, the other 4 are in my hand. Again, this is why I wanted to get the build out ASAP. Even though right now my opponent has more than enough tags for me to cycle build out for the win, I, prob I probably could have won by now to be in all fairness if I had kept the build and the cycle, but whatever. Uh, we'll s we still have a good chance of winning. As long as my, I, my opponent has no way of getting to my hand, I'm good to go. Um, what I really should have done here was to count my opponent's influence. If they have rebirth into Omar and the Omar HQ, uh, they can easily win. So this is something, this is a big oversight from me. I should have counted and realized my opponent was on triple siphon and one levy. So uh, there was no way they could rebirth. But in any case, I dug very deep for my double cycle. I knew there were two in my deck and I found them both. Uh, just one click short of cycle food out for the win on that turn, so I'll just have to wait till the next turn. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to ice up HQ because, you know, counter surveillance on HQ loses me the game. So, um, here my opponent runs archives finally. This is a very smart move, my opponent, getting me to put the agendas back in R&D. So I'm going to ruse them here by shuffling two face downs, two irrelevant face downs and a Jackson Howard in, knowing that even with this counter surveillance, they're going to see my entire deck. And no agendas. Haha. -ha. So yeah, counter surveillance onto the wrong server. Nothing beats watching your opponent excitedly carry out their win condition when you know deep down that they stood no chance at all. Ruse! This was just a slew of ruses from the very first sink trash of Yerong Nymph Mercs all the way to luring my opponent into an agendaless R&D. This seemed like too much ruse to handle. But wait, there's an even bigger ruse that you might not even be aware of because now we are going to go into the post-game analysis of the card in question, MC Austerity only to realize that it was not even played at all. That's right, this unsuccessful demo was completely unsuccessful because we did not get to see MCA in action at all. Well, what a crazy episode. Even though you learned absolutely nothing from this video, I at least hope that it was an entertaining watch. I've gone completely out of character. Um, those of you who know me, um, you know that it is very rare for me to uh, assume an uh, arrogant voice such as this. I re I just cringe when I uh, rewatch myself uh, talking about <laughs> my second placing at Worlds or um, wantonly mispronouncing that uh, Yerong Nifmuk. So if any of that was offensive or um, you know not enjoyable to watch, please let me know in the comments and I do apologize in advance if anyone uh, doesn't like it. But otherwise, I hope it was entertaining for the rest of you. In the meantime, as always, thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll get a more successful demo the next time. Not that that says much, but well, goodbye. Yerognif Mercs. Yerognif Mercs. Yerognif Mercs. Yerognif Mercs. Yermanok works. Yalganov Meglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleglegleg